Hey y'all, uh, my name is Melvin Medina. I'm the Advocacy and Outreach Director here at the ACLU of Connecticut, and I'm with our Executive Director, David McGuire. And David today is going to give us an update about what's going on at the legislature, uh, and in particular a few bills um, that uh, we, we were working on. Uh, so David, why don't we start with uh, House Bill 7285, which is a police complaint bill that's at the legislature. Sure. So that, that's one of our, our top priority bills this year. And that's a bill that would uh, address some of the shortcomings with our police complaint process here in Connecticut. That is the mechanism that allows people to file complaints alleging police misconduct. This is an issue that we've been working on for a while. We did a report back in 2012 where we identified a lot of shortcomings, essentially barriers that police are putting in place that made it difficult more intimidating for people to file complaints. And it's an important issue because it will, first of all, allow people to be heard and, and, and get some redress for their rights being violated, but also give police administrators a really meaningful opportunity to uh, take care of problems, whether it be an officer or some need for some retraining. Um, that bill just got out of the Judiciary Committee earlier this week, um, so it will be alive for the rest of the session. It will now have to go to potentially some other committees and eventually a vote before the House and the Senate before the governor gets it. So this is pretty early in the campaign. We're halfway through the legislative session. And on that bill, we Bell has been very, very active and able to engage quite a few of our members, which has been great. And we've gotten the bill out of committee, which was no small feat. Um, but we want to amend that bill and, and make it stronger. Instead of just identifying the problem and leaving it to the police to come up with a solution, we think we have um, after listening to the community and doing some research, three solutions that would help fix the problem. Um, one is to come up with a standardized complaint form, a form that's really accessible, made available in commonly spoken languages, um, and one that everyone in the state could use. So you'd be able to get it from a number of different sources. The second is to have some reporting and tracking of the complaint so that the person complaining can see their complaint tracked through the process. And also at the end of the year, the police would report to the state how many complaints they received and what happened to those so we could figure out if the internal affairs mechanism is working. And then the very last and probably most important piece is putting some teeth into the law, as people would say. Um, a real repercussion if police don't comply with the police complaint laws so that they have a real incentive to follow the law and, and listen to the public. And there's also uh, an important uh, body cam that they'll believe at the legislature, House Bill 7308. Could you give us an update on that too? Sure, so there were three body camera bills this year, um, and those kind of play off a bill that we passed two years ago, a big excessive force bill. One component of that bill was uh, the state of Connecticut bonded out $10 million for the public to per for the police departments to purchase body cameras and also to pay for the first year of storage. We've been very disappointed to see that fewer than 10% than, uh, of the departments in Connecticut have taken advantage of that. Um, so there are three bills this year, one of which is still in play, and that, that is uh, House Bill 7308. That's a body camera study bill so that we can deal with issues of, of privacy and data storage, um, really kind of answer the question so that there can be widespread adoption of body cameras in a way that protects the public. It's important to recognize that if a department could have body cameras on all the officers, but if there's not good policies, they won't protect the public. In fact, they can be used just to protect the officers, which is not the idea. It's the idea is to have a real tr neutral third-party perspective so we know what happens and can resolve situations. Um, that bill, like the police accountability bill, the complaint bill, we're trying to amend it to make it a bit more meaningful. Um, so we want to extend the window for police to get full reimbursement. That actually um, expires in July of this year. So we want to give police more opportunity to take advantage of the program. Um, and then we also want to answer some questions about data storage. We think that the state should host uh, cloud space, essentially, where police would be able to keep the data in a segregated area so it will be you know, safe and really accessible for police accountability. So we're going to be pushing that throughout the rest of the session. And there was also a solitary confinement bill, House Bill 7302, that got a great deal of input from the community at the legislature. Can you give us an update on that? Yeah, that's one of the, the really exciting national um, pieces of legislation this year in the entire country. It's a bill that would um, do quite a lot in terms of reforming and keeping the gains we've made in terms of the use of solitary confinement. 
Um, the ACLU of Connecticut for many years at this point, probably seven or eight, have been really concerned about the overuse or misuse of solitary confinement. Um, and I've had clients over the years who have been incarcerated for really minor crimes, for example, six degree larceny, that's, that's stealing a candy bar, um, that have ended up through the system ending at the supermax in really harsh conditions. Um, and, and mainly a lot of the underlying issue is, is mental health issues. Um, we've also seen that we have among the worst racial disparities in our solitary population. So this bill is a very robust bill that would set some limits you know, of how long someone can be in solitary would cap it at six months. Essentially say to the DOC, if you can't figure something out or, or help a person or get them on track after six months, you should find an alternative placement. And then it goes on to completely ban the use of solitary for juveniles and for people with mental health issues. So this would put some really great safeguards in place. And then lastly, this is definitely a theme for us, data reporting, um, to have the DOC report annually on who goes to solitary, their, their, their background, you know, race, ethnicity, age, gender, and then why they were sent there. So we can get a handle on how this is all working. And also that would hopefully prevent a future correction commissioner from overusing this again. The public would know that this is happening and we would be able to take action. And we held a Facebook Live event uh, a couple weeks ago covering civil asset forfeiture. Can you give us an update on that? That's House Bill 7146. Sure, so that's one of the really exciting pieces of legislation that has bipartisan support this year. Um, there are, it's a really unique situation where you're seeing some um, legislation from all over the spectrum come together and say, Civil asset forfeiture is not fair. It, it's a due process problem. It just does not seem right to take someone's property before they're convicted or even when they're not charged in some cases. So we're working with a number of different legislators on refining the language. That bill was a banking committee bill, and it progressed out of that committee about three weeks ago. It will have to go to the Judiciary Committee next, but we're trying to get the language just right. So listening to um, the public, legislators and also national groups to try to figure out the best way to tackle this. But that will be a bill um, that we will push with a, a broad coalition throughout the session. Now there's House Bill 7260, uh, which uh, involves drones that got quite a bit of attention, not yeah. just in the state, but nationally. Could you tell us uh, what happened with that and where we are at the legislature? Sure. So that, so that bill uh, is a bill that we have pushed for uh, four years at this point. This is the fourth year that Connecticut is considered a drone bill and what those bills are at their core is, is a privacy bill. It's a bill that would make sure that police don't misuse drones or use them in a way to violate someone's privacy rights. Um, again, an issue where we've had wide consensus, Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians all agree um, that we don't want police flying a drone uh, without any safeguards up to your second story window, for example, or tracking you or you know monitoring a crowd at a political rally. So um, we again helped get a bill introduced that has very strong language. We require police to get the warrant before they use it, unless it's an emergency where they can deploy it immediately. So that's the kind of missing children, um, you know, fleeing dangerous offender. Um, but otherwise, they would need to get a warrant. And then it also had a very strict prohibition against the weaponization of drones by both the police and the public. Again, this has been a concept that has not been controversial. Everyone agreed that this is a dangerous precedent to set. Um, in fact, the legislature's nonpartisan policy group did a study of drones back three years ago, and, and their third conclusion was no one should weaponize drones, including the police. Well, this year that we testified in support of the, the bill that had the privacy protections, and then it came up for a vote last week in the Judiciary Committee, and there was an amendment offered, which was a surprise to, to mm -hmm. us, uh, and that took out the language prohibiting police from weaponizing. And the legislators sought clarification and, in fact, got the answer. This would allow police to put both lethal and non-lethal weapons on drones. As you said, Mel, this got tremendous national attention for all the wrong reasons. Um, so we are going to work hard to get that weaponization ban put back in. Because the reality is we want this bill to pass. This is a bill that started out as a bill that would respect people's rights, turned into one that could potentially undermine people's rights. So we're going to try to write this and get it back to its original form. And there are a couple of proactive bills at the legislature that are that aim to defend the progress that we've made in this state. Uh, could you tell us a bit about the conversion therapy bill that's at the legislature? Sure. So this bill has gotten some attention as well. Um, it's been quiet lately, mainly because there's such broad consensus that we need to do this. 
this bill would essentially um, ban uh, licensed therapists from practicing conversion therapy. That's the idea that um, the, the, the concept that you can kind of prevent someone from being gay. Um, there's absolutely clear evidence that it's harmful to young people um, and wide consensus in the medical community that it is beyond the standard of care. This is not only doesn't work, it hurts people um, and can damage them for their entire life. So we are working with, again, a really broad coalition. Um, this, the minority uh, leader in the House, Dennis Byardis, has signed on. Um, lots of different people across the spectrum who agree we should prevent this practice from taking hold. Um, this bill has over 80 co-sponsors right now, mm -hmm. which is really tremendous, um, and we'll continue to push this through. I, I think this will be one of the earlier bills acted on this session. And there's also a national conversation and a statewide conversation on health care coverage. Um, there's an important bill uh, that covers contraceptive uh, coverage. Can you tell us a bit about that? Right. So this is a bill that would ensure that if there are changes to national health care policy, that women would continue to be able to get contraceptive coverage. So um, again, it's, it, the common theme here is a lot of these bills have uh, wide, wide support. Um, but what I do want to flag for the Facebook watchers is that this is a session where there's a lot of bills in play. More bills have been raised this year than ever before in Connecticut history. So there's a lot of bills out there. Um, and as always, our biggest enemy is the clock. Very rarely do bills in Connecticut get voted down. They essentially run out of time and don't get to get through the process. So it is important that you find the three or four bills that really matter to you and keep engaged on them. Contact your legislator because when a bill goes quiet, when there's not a whole lot of activity, it is likely to get pushed back to the back of the line and then probably run out of time. So it's and, important to stay engaged. And for the folks that are watching, when a bill runs out of time, does that mean that the following year you start where you left off? No. So we're one, we're one of uh, a minority of states that have what they call Cinderella session. So if the bill does not get through the entire process before the close of the session, which is in June this year, it is done and you have to start from scratch next year. So the drone bill is a great example. Um, the past two years it has passed one chamber, and this was a bill that, that banned weaponization, to be clear, um, but did not get to the second. So we had to start the process from scratch again, and, and that, that, that is really burdensome. So it's important that when we have something really close that we put the effort in and push it over the finish line. And now I've, I've heard from many community members who want to get engaged and involved on these issues. Um, since most of these bills have come out of committee, what can people do right now, today, to, to keep the issues alive and make sure that they sure. keep moving forward? Yeah, so like Mel said, the hearings have all ended. So right now, it's all committee action. Those are open to the public, but there's not public participation in them in the formal sense of you signing up and testifying. So there are a couple of things you can do. You can write to, to let your legislators and leadership, and there's lots of information on that on our website, and it's easy to find who your legislators are if you're not sure who they are. The other thing is you can go to the legislature and um, try to meet with your legislator in person. And even if you can't find them there that day, if you go to the lead the office that they're in, you could ask to speak with their aide. They're almost always there. Um, leave a note uh, and or speak with their aide and just stay really engaged. Um, phone calls work really well. Don't take long. They have a person for every chamber for every you know House Dems, House Republicans. All of that, you call the number, you say who your rep is, and they'll get you in touch with the proper person. And as the Advocacy and Outreach Director, I can help you do that. Uh, you can email me at mmedina, that's M-M-E-D-I-N-A, at ACLUCT.org. You can call my office, 860-471-8473, and I can help you along in that <coughs> process, whether it be writing testimony, calling your legislator, scheduling that meeting. That's what I'm here for. Thank you guys for joining us for this legislative update, uh, and I hope you enjoyed it, and, and please do reach out to us. Thanks so much.